Welcome to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021, um, approximately 1 p.m. Let the record reflect that there is a quorum. I'm calling to order. Members, to, uh, the bills we are having today will, are going to be laid over for possible inclusion. And the first bill we have, have up today is Senate File 1166, Senator Thomas Sony. Uh, welcome to the committee and when you're ready. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So Senate File 1166 is a result of uh, all the things that have happened during COVID and uh, not being able to meet timeframes. And it's it's re related to the, uh, 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 the Section 404 permitting under the Federal Clean Water Act and having it assumed by the state. And because of the the COVID issues, they, they weren't able to get it done in time. And quite frankly, Madam Chair, all the bill does is um, extend the time frame for them to do what had already been passed in a previous session. And if you would like to hear testimony, Madam Chair, um, we do have Les Lem from the Wetland Section Manager of the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. You're muted, Madam Chair. Happens to the best of us. I know. <laughs> All right, uh, let's hear from Mr. Lem if he's here. Thank you. Um, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, Les Lem, I am the wetlands section manager for the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, so, as Senator Thompsonny mentioned, this 2019 appropriation was uh, it provided $200,000 to begin the development of the materials required for Minnesota to assume the Section 404 permitting program of the Federal Clean Water Act, so also known as 404 Assumption. So, in a nutshell, 404 Assumption it strengthens the state water and wetland programs while simplifying and streamlining the regulatory process for landowners. So despite some of the challenges of the last year, we actually have made substantial progress. Uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources is coordinating the project through an agreement with the Environmental Quality Board. And we have uh, agreements with the Department of Natural Resources and the Pollution Control Agency for various aspects of the work as well. There's, uh, you can find more details on our progress in the status report that was provided to you dated January 28, 2021. Uh, but in addition to this being a very complicated and time consuming effort, um, COVID has hampered our ability to coordinate effectively with the federal government and with others. So we're simply requesting an extension in the time frame to develop the legislative report and the associated budget estimates. So I'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lem. Members, are there any uh, questions on this bill? All right, I don't see any, with no further discussion, we are going to uh, lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lem, and thank you, Senator Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Senate File 880, so I will hand the gavel to Senator Weber. Senator, you're on mute. <laughs> it's how we gauge our success some days, so bring to unmute, okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to your committee, and uh, you may proceed with Senate File 880 when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, Senate File 880 is really just kind of a cleanup bill. It's uh, we, We're changing one word in the 2019 legislative session. Um, we... Um, uh, the Watershed District Board members had their per diem um, cap increased from $75 to $125, that's up to. And uh, we uh, missed including the Soil and Water Conservation District supervisors in that raise. So this just includes them uh, so the board and the supervisors are capped at that rate. And I have with me... Um, uh, Ms. Vanny from the uh, Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Boards, if you have a question, but it's really a pretty straight up bill. Members, are there any questions or comments? I don't see any uh, uh, on the list here. 
So if everyone is okay with everything, uh, we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion into an omnibus bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We'll now proceed to Senate File 14, Senator Rood. Um, members, um, this is a bill that we have had um, for quite a, uh, quite, a, quite a long time. And so I, I wanted to bring it forth again today. So um, Senate File 14, you can see uh, it has a low number because it's really an important issue um, that has really been bubbling in the state. So I first started, I'll give you a little history of this bill. So I first started on uh, with this bill in 2017. We had Senate Bill 1370. And at the time we felt that the, the bait industry was in uh, semi-crisis. There wasn't enough bait uh, out there for our dealers. Um, but at the time we had a different governor and a different DNR commissioner and a different fisheries chief. Um, and so it, it was quite a time. Um, we introduced the um, Arkans uh, getting um, certified bait from Arkansas, and there was quite a, quite a conversation, and it ended up with letters being written back and forth from uh, Arkansas to our governor to our um, DNR chief because of disparaging marks about Arkansas, and so it was it was uh, quite a, an interesting um, bill, um, but. We didn't make any progress with that. And so what did we do? Typically what the legislation legislature always does when they can't make a decision, we funded a study. And so we funded a study that said uh, the DNR had to come back with a study um, uh, in, by January 15th of 2018. Um, and uh, which they did, but uh, no offense to anyone here, but it, I, I kind of felt the study was like having the fox doing a study on how to, how to make the hen house safe. And so the, the conclusions were exactly what the conclusions uh, were asked to be, I think. But anyway, that's just my opinion. So uh, they submitted the report. It's about a 75 page report and it's an, it's an available um, online and it was date, the report is dated 214.8. Uh, 18. So they acknowledged in the report uh, that Minnesota's climate um, is not conducive to producing shiners. Shiners only grow in ponds. You can grow them in tanks, but they don't grow uh, large enough um, to be a bait fish for fishing. Um, and so, of course, Minnesota isn't conducive unless you have heated ponds. So the conclusion at the end of the report was um, that it identified an alternate to importing the golden shiners. They want us to invest in the increasing golden shiner culture within the state of Minnesota. Uh, and this could provide an opportunity to invest in Minnesota's own industry and maintain the current level of protection against pathogens and invasive species. And that was in February of 2018. So now we come to 2019 and we have a new governor and a new commissioner and a new fisheries chief but we still have uh, nothing, no, and the bait dealers are very frustrated with what's going on. There's no bait, no importation, no Minnesota uh, minnows, no progress. And so in May of 2019, I introduced tw uh, Senate file 2895, same bill. And then it was too late to make any um, bill deadlines, but we wanted to keep it in front of the DNR that this is an important issue going forward and we don't have a bait industry and we don't have bait in Minnesota. So we wanted to keep it in front of the DNR to do something. So um, now we are in January of 2021 and we, we've introduced, uh, you know, uh, Senate file 14 because we have the same problem that we had in 2017 and we haven't progressed. But what we do have is a pandemic uh, that has really pushed this into industry into crisis. So we have now sold um, more uh, fishing licenses than we have uh, it, the highest record in 20 years. We are almost at uh, over 130,000 more fishing licenses than we than we sold last year, and the bait um, crisis is is still here. So I, uh, I, I got an email from a, a fisherman uh, on Mille Lacs um, and he said that he paid, if he could find them, $19 a dozen. And that's not a scoop, that's a counted dozen for shiners. 
So in the documents that I've sent you, and I hope you had the opportunity to um, look at them, I shared with you what an amazing program Arkansas has. They, uh, I, uh, in your documents is the legislation that they passed back in 2005, realizing that they had um, uh, an opportunity there. And they, the bill that they passed was an act to establish a commercial bait and ornamental fish program under the state plant board. Uh, and since then, they've done an amazing job. And I also include the rules on aquaculture in Arkansas. They have the strictest and most comprehensive in the country. They use the OIA, OIA list for diseases, which is the World Organization for Animal Health. And uh, they ship uh, their minnows um, all over the world in the United States. And then there's a letter from the University of Arkansas, which has really worked with the uh, Ag Department on putting this program together. So uh, I, Arkansas farms produce 90% of the bait in the United States. And the farmers breed, hatch, and raise over 6 billion, that's billion with a B, bait fish annually. And they have an economic impact for Arkansas of 300 million to $350 million. So, uh, like I said, in 2005, they put this together and the University of Arkansas really helped them with this. And they adopted the Arkansas Bait Certification Program to guarantee quality and safe and a biosecure product. And they have federal and state inspections of these farms twice annually. Uh, it also takes over uh, two years uh, with the stringent qualifications for any farm um, to uh, qualify for this to help their, their bait situation. So we know that the current pressure on our bait uh, and, the, and what's happening in the, in, the, um, in the state of Minnesota, and I think it's time that we allow this to happen. Um, they, uh, the protocols that they have put in place are incredible. They even import fish uh, into California, with, which has the strictest environmental protocols in the United States. So I think if you look at this program, um, it's something we should uh, consider. Um, if we were going, I don't think we need to, to um, you know, it would take years to reinvent the, the wheel in Minnesota. I don't, I don't think it's, it's something that, um, it can be done on a limited basis in Minnesota, but nothing like Arkansas and, and importing this bait could really um, help our fishermen and our bait dealers uh, right now. So with that members, um, I know that um, uh, Mr. Parsons is here today, so, um, but I'll stand for questions. Very good, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, we will turn to Brad Parsons, the DNR Fisheries Section Manager. And um, Mr. Parsons, please identify yourself for the record and welcome. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Brad Parsons. I'm the Fisheries Section Manager for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak today. Um, you know, Senator Rood laid out um, a, a lot of a lot of good things there, but I do need to say that we we do still have concerns over importation of minnows due primarily to invasive species and fish diseases. Um, I, if I could state for the record, I work very closely with my colleagues in Arkansas on Mississippi River issues, and and this is in no way meant to um, disparage Arkansas as perhaps <laughs> earlier. That, that was before my time. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Root. Um, the, but again, the, the issue is, is there are numerous um, organisms out there that could end up in the state uh, that we don't want in the state. They include certain fish parasites uh, related to golden shiners. And there are other things such as uh, uh, mosquito fish, which are pro prohibited fish that are also raised in Arkansas. There are non-native crayfishes as well that have uh, caused severe issues in, in other states as well. And um, my, uh, I'll just be honest with you, my, my knowledge of the new rules that Arkansas has put in place are, are not complete. So I will, I will avoid speaking to that today. But um, you know, it's important to note that we have several different kinds of bait in the state of Minnesota. Um, what this is primarily targeted at is golden shiners when you're thinking about uh, opening day, oftentimes what that is is spot tail shiners that are harvested 
uh, out of our natural lakes here in Minnesota. We are currently uh, trying very hard. Uh, we have language that uh, will help the bait and the aquaculture industry in this state uh, if, if we get it through regarding VHS, which is called viral hemorrhagic septicemia. It's a, it's a fish disease that has caused serious problems in the St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence River, uh, Lake Michigan, et cetera. So uh, we have that language that will make wild bait harvest a great deal easier if we can do that. And that should help the supply issues. Um, the other thing that, that has advanced as well, um, it was included for funding in the LCCMR bill for rules of, of 2020. But of course, due to COVID that did not get acted upon last year, where Sea Grant does have a project now in order to fund ways of raising golden shiners in captivity, which could include things like aquaponics, et cetera. You know, we, we have um, aquaponics that raise vegetables, but they can also raise fish at the same time. Some do it, most who do it, do it with tilapia. But uh, frankly, uh, given the, the costs that Senator Rood correctly pointed out for golden shiners, uh, if you can rear them in that, that would be a, a very good uh, way to go as well. So um, at, at this point, um, I think I think our department position has not has not changed. We still have those um, real concerns over invasive species, which includes invasive carps, the silver, the big headed carps. Um, we also have uh, some issues with the way the, the language reads in terms of uh, some of our permitting processes, but that's kind of getting into the weeds. So I won't I won't bore you with that. So um, at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I I would stand for questions or um, whatever you would would like, sir. Uh, first, let me ask, is there anyone else? I have no one else on the list. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify concerning this issue? If not, uh, Mr. Parsons, I, I have a question. I'm just wondering, do you know of any <clears throat> problems that have arisen in other states that do import uh, the bait fish uh, from Arkansas? Sorry, I was muted there, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, not necessarily with bait, but there there have been instances. I know in in the Chicago area where uh, big headed carps ended up in ponds that were uh, there was really no other way of them getting there other than uh, I believe it was channel catfish that were bought from the state of from Arkansas. But and if I understand correctly, the golden shiners are raised in controlled environment. Is that correct? Yes, but so are channel catfish as well. It, it, there, it, it, it's a pond aqu aquaculture system very similar to to what um, what we have, for example, at our Waterville or New London hatcheries where we rear uh, walleye and uh, muskies in ponds. So, and Ms. Mr. Chair, if I can yes. respond to that. Yeah, so the please, bait fish are, The bait fish are very specific um, and they, they go through rigorous, rigorous uh, testing. And um, if any pond is found to have anything in it that it's not supposed to, they, they immediately destroy, destroy the whole pond. And so it's very, um, uh, very controlled. And um, we're talking about bait fish. We're not talking about the other, other kinds of fish. We're, we're really talking about golden shiners and uh, they really do a rigorous uh, certification there and, uh, and a controlled. Um, and, and if the language in the bill needs to be tweaked, I'd be happy to work with Mr. Parsons on that. Um, but I, I, I really think that they have not. I, uh, um, I spoke with um, a, a farmer in Arkansas on Monday morning, and he was uh, very gracious with his time with me. And uh, they have not found any problems uh, across the nation, or they, they do ship internationally, too. And so I, I, I think if there has not been a problem and they're, and they're very um, conscientious about what they do and what they don't do, and uh, if no one else has had a, a problem, I, 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 think, uh, I think it's pretty safe for everyone else in the world. Thank you, Senator Rood. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a quick question procedurally. Is this bill 
going to be laid over or are we going to vote on it? This bill would be laid over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, I do have some concerns about the bill, all due respect to to the state of Arkansas and, the, and their rules and regulations about um, uh, farming minnows and, and the way that they do that. But um, there's no other place like Minnesota than our waters. I'm, I'm just been I've been reading about and learning about the invasive species problem, and and um, I know that in in the reading that I have done, um, I did start to learn about the carp issue down in, in with the Mississippi River, and I know that Arkansas um, there was some connection there. I, I and I am also aware in in what I'm learning that all it takes is just that one time. You know, we we can have um, lots of um, regulations in place, but um, this this invasive invasive species problem is really insidious, and so um, I guess. I would be looking for some real, um, real reassurances about the uh, about exactly the procedures that uh, and the and the the frequency of testing, and and to know before I would be comfortable <laughs> with with putting um, minnows, you know, farmed in Arkansas into our Minnesota waters that are really the jewel of our state. Thanks. And uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rood, and and. Senator McEwen, I think if you would go through all the documentations that I had sent to you before this, you would see all the testing information, all the diseases that are tested for, all the frequencies, it's all in the documentation that I sent you. And so um, if you would like some really good, exciting reading um, to learn about it, that that's where you should go. And I will say on the invasive carp piece, you know, I've worked on that for probably mm -hmm. 15 years and we've put some incredible barriers in place, both for the Great Lakes. Uh, we are up in Detroit looking at the new uh, electronic barriers that they have to keep the carp out of the, out of the lakes. We put uh, money into the dam at, in Anoka and in Champlain, and we closed the locks. And so a lot, a lot of work has been done to protect our waters. And I would never do anything that I felt would not protect our waters because it's been my main uh, focus for many, many years. So I just uh, wanted to address uh, and, and assure you that I would never do anything um, to that I thought would harm our waters. Thank you, Senator Rood. Uh, next, uh, Senator McEwen, excuse me. I did just um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Senator Rood. And we did receive those documents this morning a little after 10 o'clock. I, I will. I did peruse them briefly, but I'll, I'll take a closer look um, and, and see. It does concern me that our DNR isn't behind this um, because I do trust the, the scientists who are working there and, and I do value their opinion. But thank you for all of your work to protect our waters. And, and I do hope that if this moves forward that um, we can get consensus and, and assurances about um, the invasive species piece. Thank you. Very good. Next, Senator Swazinski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions for Madam Chair. One, is there, I mean, if we want to try to grow our own, and is there somehow in legacy money that we could establish a grant or something for some outfit or bait producer or harvester or farmer would be able to grow these um, minnows here and that we could use legacy money out of the clean water fund or something i'm just brainstorming um to, to, because of the dnr's concerns over importing fish from our or, you know minnows um, bait from arkansas um because it seems like the clean water fund would that, that this is like a a good uh, use of that money um and then my second question could you run, give me those that data again of the number of fishing licenses that's just uh wonderful news um the, the number um uh, that more and more people are getting outdoors and um, using. Um, so I'd like to get that number again, if you don't mind. I'd like to use it um, in other venues. So thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Rood. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Sudinsky. Um, well, I, I think it would be inappropriate to use legacy funds to fund a private industry. Um, you know, if uh, if the bait industry goes forward and it was something that they could they could do. I, I don't think that using, you know, taxpayer dollars for a private company would would be very appropriate. Um, and uh, and it is difficult to grow here because of the you would have to have heated ponds and 
you know, the water freezes and, and that type of thing. Um, and as far as the fishing licenses, I'm going to send that over to Mr. Parsons because he's got a, probably got a better handle on the exact number um, uh, for this year. Okay, Mr. Parsons. You're on mute, mute Mr. Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> at least sorry M mr chair senator ruid at least you did that earlier so <laughs> thank you for that um yeah we uh we we did we had an excellent year we we sold um a total and our license year actually ended on february 28th which is when our our fishing our walleye and pike season and our license year ends uh we sold uh over 1.2 million licenses this year um, that is that is up uh, over 10% from last year, and I can't remember if it was this committee meeting or the previous one we were in, Senator Rood, that you mentioned that that's really about the highest we've seen in 20 years. So it's 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 a really it's a great thing, and not only did we sell more licenses, but um, it was very apparent that people were just fishing more, and um, we had a lot of comments, particularly from the northern part of the state, about just a lot of people out angling, which is terrific. Um, unfortunately, we, we do think that some of that was due to uh, what our uh, partners in Ontario uh, had to deal with, with a closed border. And I know I've uh, spoken to my counterpart up there and it was a very tough year for their resorts, but places like Rainy Lake, Winnie, Bacagama, we heard Lake of the Woods, we heard very much so that it was the highest fishing pressure they'd seen in a great, great deal of time. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, yes. one more comment. I, I would like to say, you know, um, I, I read in the in the outdoor news how you know our COs are are having to enforce our laws, and that's what we that's what we have them do. You know, we have laws about importing bait, and we know that bait's coming from other places. Bait's coming from Iowa and North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and so. I, Personally, I would really rather know where our bait is coming from and have it coming into Minnesota from a certified place than to have um, bait coming from other areas illegally because we don't have any. And that's what I see having uh, um, happening um, out there. Um, and with that, I know we're going to lay the bill over, but I, I do want the committee to know that um, Mr. Parsons and Mr. Meyer and the fisheries have been very... Um, uh, helpful to me in working through this and they are uh, helpful on all the issues with the we just did the four walleye limit bill and so they've been very uh, open and honest in working through these issues um, and they're very difficult issues to work with and so I still believe in, uh, this is the way to go and they don't and I'm hoping that we can find a way forward so thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I would just comment as well, and I live in the southwest corner of the state, and our fishing situation is a little different since I, my home county has no lake in it. Uh, but um, I do know that when uh, even the cost of, of plain chubs uh, that, uh, and minnows that we use uh, when we, if we go fishing uh, have went up substantially just due to a lack of them. And when I think about young families going out and trying to get these young people interested in fishing uh, and uh, what have you, that um, quite frankly, the bait cost has become uh, a substantial element. And uh, particularly if you're driving 45 minutes to an hour in order to get to the lake to fish in the first place. And, um, and so we keep talking about wanting to promote that amongst our youth. And yet we never quite seem to take all the steps that help a family um, make fishing a part of their normal activity. So um, with that, I see no other comments or questions. And uh, I would um, mention that declare that this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. And at this point, I will turn the gavel back to Chair Rood. Thank you, Senator Weber. Our members next up, we have Senate File 854, uh, Senator Putnam. Ah, Senator Putnam, welcome to the committee. I don't be, think you've been before us before. So welcome and identify yourself and uh, proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'm Senator Eric Putnam, and I'm here to talk about Senate File 854. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair and members, for hearing this. I can't promise it's going to be as exciting as minnows, 
Uh, we're talking about stormwater, uh, but it's also a very simple and straightforward issue. Uh, Senate File 854 is designed to clarify um, uh, discrepancy with the language of a 2019 change to stormwater permitting. The bill language was provided by the MPCA, and we are not aware of any opposition to this bill. Um, so we have a representative from the Association of Minnesota Counties and another from the MPCA um, to offer some additional comments or answer any questions that the committee has. Thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Martinson, uh, do I see you on the screen here? There you are. Mr. Martinson, welcome to the committee. Please uh, identify yourself and proceed when you're ready. Sorry, just getting things lined up here. <laughs> um, Madam Chair and committee, <clears throat> My name is Brian Martinson, and I'm the Environment and Policy uh, Natural Resources Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties, representing all 87 counties of the state. Uh, we we bring this language to you really as a correction to a, a 2019 legislation that was passed by your committee to help out townships that were located near fast growing municipalities and from having to undertake the extensive planning and permitting requirements that go along with uh, stormwater management. That language was amended during the committee meeting and after passage, it was reviewed by technical staff at the MPCA and was determined that they felt it may be applicable now to certain unurbanized areas of counties that would now have to be subject to that permitting requirement. Uh, we had discussions with the authors, uh, with the proponents and with the agency, and there was agreement that that was not the intention of the original bill and and that the language should be corrected we were provided with the language before you now by the agency at that time uh, this language was brought forward and I, I believe heard by your committee again last year unfortunately uh circumstances of that legislative session prevented a uh, environment omnibus bill from being passed so we bring it before you again this year just to clean up the language and, and make sure the original intent of the 2019 bill is met. Thank you, Mr. Martinson. Is there anyone else that would like to testify to this bill? I sometimes feel that it's Groundhog Day because <laughs> <laughs> so many of what we're doing is what we already did before to do over again. So. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Putnam, for bringing this forward and making this correction. And um, if I, I see, oops, Senator Senjum, your hand is up. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and perhaps just a question for Mr. Martinson. Uh, my recollection, and we're all product of life experience, uh, uh, a township that was in and around Rochester uh, was included in this requirement, I believe, if they were in what we call, I think, the Metropolitan Service Area, and those that were outside of the Metropolitan Service Area of Rochester were, were not deemed to have to go through this stormwater management process. Is that still correct, or has that changed? Mr. Martinson. Madam Chair, I, I could, uh, attempt to answer that, but we have the director of the municipal division at PCA uh, on the line, I believe, and she may be able to give a more uh, clear and concise response. Uh, thank you. Uh, if if she, she if, if she's able. Um, and I'm not sure who that is. Um, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So Dana Vanderbosch is uh, with us, I believe. Um, I just saw her name and now it disappeared, but- No, it's, it's um, here. I think- 
Yes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, my name is Dana Vanderbosch and I am the director of the municipal division at the MPCA. And uh, in answer to the question that Senator Senjum raised, yes, his understanding is correct. Um, townships are subject to the MS4 regulations when they have <clears throat> what are called urbanized areas as defined by the US Senate or by the US Census, I'm sorry. Um, but it is not our intention that counties with um, uh, you know, non-urbanized or unorganized areas are, it, it wasn't our intention that those portions of the counties be subject to stormwater regulations. So this bill just really seeks, um, we agree with Mr. Martinson that this bill is really a housekeeping bill to just clarify the language and to clarify uh, which portions of counties stormwater regulations apply to. Senator Sendum, does that answer your question? Maybe just a quick, follow up with a yes or no so if uh, if a if a part of a township that was characteristically looked to you and I like fairly rural but was otherwise included in the metropolitan service area designation would that still be covered Ms. Uh, Vanderbosch um madam chair uh, senator Senjum if the portion of the township is considered part of the urbanized area, and so if it is a part of the, um, if it's a part of that urbanized area within the township as defined in the U.S. Senate, or I'm sorry, the U.S. Census, then yes, it would be subject to those stormwater regulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Sendum, does that answer your, uh, yes, clarify uh, your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe Ms. Gautier would like to um, testify. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Greta Gothier, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I'll be very brief. I agree with, with what uh, Mr. Martinson from the Association of Minnesota County said. We have worked on this language with them and we support the language to move forward. It will make uh, the programs easier to implement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Putnam, any last closing comments? No, just thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee for hearing this issue so expeditiously. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. With that, members, uh, Senate File 854 will be laid over for possible inclusion. And thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Senate File uh, 1394. Senator Herr, I proceed thank when you. you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Senate file 1364, which modifies turtle taking provision. Turtles are one of our most vulnerable species in Minnesota. Our turtle population can no longer sustain the pressure of commercial harvest, especially when combined with impacts from unreported recreational harvest. This bill, Senate file 1364, will expedite the process of phasing out commercial turtle harvest in Minnesota, like most other states in the country. Senator Hurt, yes. Senator Hurt, my understanding is you have an eight authors amendment, the A two. Yes, yes, can I will get that. Can we do that? I do first that right and now. Then you can speak to Bill. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> okay, okay. Senator yes. Hurt moves just... the A two amendment and authors amendment. All those in yes. favor, say aye. Those opposed. Thank you, yes, Senator thank you. Hur. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry the... for the interruption. No, no, I'm just about to talk about the amendment right now. So right. Uh, perfect. And the, the amendment, you know, is is uh, in addition to what already in, in our statute, it prohibits use of firearms, bow and arrow, spear, or harpoon to take turtles. It limits the uh, take up to three Western Payton turtles and it bans spiny soft shell possession, except for aquatic farm licensee. And it allows youth under 16 to possess turtle for personal use without license or permit. So, Madam Chair, I stand for question. And after after we hear from today's test testifiers, uh, we have a few of them. Um, okay, I, I think first up, Senator Her, we have uh -huh. Ann Pierce from the DNR. Uh, Ms. Pierce, would you like? Uh, do I see you? There she is. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed when you're ready. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Ann Pierce. I'm the Acting Director for Ecological and Water Resources with the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we have been working with Senator Herr um, on this bill and we support this bill. Um, some of you may remember back in 2004, we had worked with a variety of stakeholders to come up with a process to phase out the commercial um, turtle licenses. And we have, for a variety of reasons, that has not been as effective as we had hoped. So what has happened is we have, uh, the number of commercial fishing licenses has decreased from 43 to 22. However, um, because we are one of the only states in the country that actually is still allowing commercial turtle harvest, there's been a real focus on the state of Minnesota and harvesting more turtles. So actually the turtle harvest has gone up. In addition to that, our recreational licenses have tripled since 2004. So they went from 52 to about 158 in that period of time. And also we are not sure how many turtles are being harvested through that because there's not a reporting Piece, but we do know that our turtles are, um, their populations because of their biology is threatened by over harvest. The turtles are a long lived species. They take quite a while to mature and get to reproductive age. And if you take them before they do that, which in some cases can be 20 years, you're eliminating um, a reproductive individual from that population and it, it's decreasing the population even more. Um, we have worked with um, Senator Kerr to include um, opportunities for youth to have possessed turtles and um, you know maintain other aspects of kind of our heritage with turtles so that we can continue those kind of things into the future. The, um, the soft shell turtles, we have um, one of those is actually listed and that's the smooth soft shell. We are eliminating the spiny soft shell in this bill because it is also under threat because of, of the shell itself is actually being used for medicinal purposes and other um, purposes because it's very similar to shark fin um, cartilage. And, um, we, it's also very hard to tell the, the two species of um, soft shell turtles apart. So we have that in the bill also. And, and the DNR has is, is been working with Senator Herr and his support of this bill. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Uh, next up, we have uh, Christopher Smith from the Minnesota Herpetology Society. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Christopher Smith. I am the Conservation Committee Chair with the Minnesota Herpetological Society. I am a wildlife biologist and a hunter and angler. And so just want to provide a little bit of context. I'm here to kind of explain why this group of organisms don't make good game species. And I have a PowerPoint. If I may share my screen, I will present that. All right, are you seeing the screen okay? Yes, we are. Uh, are you still seeing it? Yes. All right, so just wanna provide a little bit of background for folks who are maybe a little bit less familiar with uh, turtle, turtle biology. So first up, Minnesota is home to a number of turtle species. You can see here and of these turtles, oops, um, three species are able to be harvested commercially. And that is the uh, painted turtle, snapping turtle, and spiny soft shell, as DNR mentioned. Um, we also have one species of turtle not shown here that is actually an invasive species in our state. And that's the red ear slider. And something that folks like me who work a lot with turtles don't always do a good job of, but is really the key take home point for why turtles are not great game species is their reproductive biology. And DNR alluded to their kind of the, the biology and how that, that implicates uh, the unsustainable nature of, of harvest. 
And so, you know, all things set equal. If you look at snapping turtles here on the left compared to white-tailed deer on the right-hand side, you know, a, a game species we're all probably very familiar with. And you start at year zero and run out through year 17, you can see that in that amount of time, the white-tailed deer would actually have the reproductive potential to have resulted in over 900 offspring. Whereas snapping turtles, on the other hand, would just be reaching adult age, sexual maturity, and would just be crawling out of the wetlands and lakes and rivers to lay their first clutch of eggs. And, and while they do have relatively large egg clutches, um, many of those nests don't survive. And it's tough to see here. It's actually uh, clipped off on my chart, I apologize. But there was a figure here that it takes over 1400 eggs laid by a snapping turtle before one of those eggs reaches adult maturity. So it takes over 1400 eggs before a replacement individual is put back into the population. And that means it takes literally decades of reproduction uh, to replace uh, the individual that was lost. And so you, you're all hopefully familiar with the fact that turtles can live a long time, but really the take home message here is that turtles must live a long time. So threats that result in adult turtle mortality have across the board been found to be unsustainable for populations long-term. Uh, also, as DNR mentioned, there was uh, efforts in the early 2000s to uh, uh, do away with commercial turtle harvest. And at the time, the kind of compromise was a moratorium on new sellers licenses. Um, turtle sellers at this time were made aware that the, the ultimate goal was to eliminate harvest. So this should really be no surprise. And even uh, uh, then Senator Lassard announced that this is the initial step. We will eliminate commercial harvest in the future. And again, as DNR mentioned, you can see three graphs here on the left showing turtle harvest through time. And uh, for painted turtles, the top graph here, this is our most commonly commercially harvested turtle. You can actually see an increasing trend in recent years uh, due in large part to increasing pressure on Minnesota due to surrounding states uh, doing away with this practice. And so just to summarize things just a little bit here, um, the bill, it removes commercial harvest. Uh, currently, I believe for the next season here, there are 20 or 19 eligible licensees remaining. So a relatively small number of individuals are actually able to do this sort of thing. Um, and it modernizes our recreational turtle harvest. So it preserves that recreational harvest and updates some of the regulations to be more in line with what we know about turtle biology and reasonable harvest limits. And then uh, just as important, the bill does not uh, prohibit recreational harvest. So folks will still be able to harvest turtles for turtle soup or other personal uses. And it doesn't prohibit things like turtle races, which I know is important uh, to many small towns out across the state of Minnesota. <laughs> and with that, um, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I think we'll hold our questions, members, until we are done with our um, testifiers. Um, I think we have Mr. Wad. Um, are you? Let's see. There we go. Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. You're on the phone. Perfect. Um, please yeah. identify yourself for the record and go ahead when you're ready. Hello, my name is uh, William Wad. Um, I'm the owner of Bio Corporation with my father, Ben Hedstrom, who is also here. And we have, uh, our family has been in the turtle business for over 100 years. Um, just wanted to point out a few things that um, when in 2002, I believe it was, we met with Senator Sams and uh, Senator Berg to work this out because it was us who were concerned about the turtles and uh, the harvest also. So we implemented a size limit and a season of all three species you have listed. Um, we also, I believe at the time there was 83 licenses. We are now down to 19 licenses. And we were guaranteed that we could pass those on to our children because it's uh, something your family does, at least one time anyways, um, to, our, to my son or my daughter. And uh, basically, 
what what's being said here, we don't agree with. The number of harvest has gone down from what we've seen. The market for the, the turtles that you're referring to is not there anymore. We have raised a, a large number of turtles ourselves here at our ponds. Um, so I don't I don't see that there's any new pressure. In fact, I'd say there's considerably less pressure and there will be less pressure in the future as the licenses continue to dwindle down. And of these 83 licenses that, that we there used to be, none of those people, the 64 people, did not pass their license down either. Um, so there is 10,000 plus lakes in this state. There's probably 100,000 ponds. They're found in all throughout the whole state um, on all, all the species actually from what I've seen. So that, that's just basically my comments. Thank you. We appreciate your input today. Okay, um, could my that, father also have a, a chance to speak too? Um, go, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, ben Hetstrom from uh, Bio Corporation in Alexandria. And uh, I've taken these turtles way over 50 years. And you go turtling right now, next July or whatever, you're going to throw back half of the turtles you catch because of the size limit and the season. These, we fought real hard in the last 20, 30 years to get everything in place to protect these turtles so this industry could go on if somebody wants to do it. Not a lot of people will do this. The outdoors person that loves a trap, maybe a, a trapper or something like that. But... Um, what I see is they are protected. And at the time when Senator uh, Sams and Berg and I was down in St. Paul talking, they agreed that we could be grandfathered in. And it was about 80, some of us done, 85 or 83 or something. And personally, I don't like it when I was agreed to that. Now they want to take that away uh, from us, the, us 19 people. And this is a pretty big state for to worry about the population. It may be in a certain county or something that might be different, but come to Ottertail County, there's a lot of lakes in Ottertail County, a lot of ponds, uh, Douglas County. It's a pretty big state, and uh, I think it should be left the way it is. That's my opinion, and I want to thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Mr. Hedstrom. We, we appreciate you taking the time today to testify. Uh, with that, uh, next we have Jeff Riedemann. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record and go ahead when you're ready. My name is Jeff Riedemann. I've been the president of the Minnesota Commercial Fishermen's Association for the last close to 27 years now. Um, I'm one of the 19 that still holds a commercial turtle license. And um, you know, I, I keep on hearing that uh, the turtle populations are going down. Some people worry that they're going extinct. And uh, I see it on my lakes up here and I fish around the metro and and that's just not the the case. The Stanton turtle population in particular is is way up there. And I know some of the senators, well, I only had like uh, four days to prepare for this meeting. Normally we were given a heads up by the DNR as to uh, when, when things like this. I remember when Roy Johannes was uh, the head of the commercial fishing program, he'd always let us know. So we had time to prepare. So it was an honest debate and we could, like some of those studies where they say a, a turtle takes 20 years before it starts laying eggs. That's not, not even close. I think it's more like five years. Some of those turtles are laying eggs, the snapping turtles and we've raised turtles and I go all across the United States and people just don't understand that uh, those turtles can become a, quite a problem. There's other things going on with our ponds and lakes other than just turtles. You know, the, the mentality that you can never have too many turtles, that logic has been applied to the sea lions and things like that and the timber wolves. And until, if people don't have to live with the consequences of some of these things, uh, they, I guess it doesn't matter to them, but like I said, I, I spend my life on the water. I read one of the comments on Lake Minnetonka. Well, we never see any painted turtles. Well, 
the lake has been completely developed just about. They've eliminated the turtle's uh, habitat, and the weeds in the lake have gone from, you know, there used to be a lot of cabbage, things like that. Now it's all milfoil, and the turtles just don't like eating the milfoil. And if you want to come out on Lake Minnetonka with me, um, the lake that they're supposed to be so endangered on, come on out, and I'll take you to the places that they are. They've just migrated into the, the few little places that uh, they still have something to eat or live on, and and I see the turtle population rising, and it's it's ironic. I know that people have offered to stock turtles. You know, if, if it was a different type of, of of an animal or a fish or something, take walleyes for example, or pheasants, we stock those things. Um, we are so lucky to have people like the Headstroms up there. They they are experts in the business. You can raise turtles and let them go. You could accomplish what Mother Nature couldn't in in one season. You could accomplish what Mother Nature couldn't in a hundred years. If uh, if it's overdeveloped and there's cars running them over, you know maybe we have to step in. We got the experts that can do it, but it's illegal for us to raise uh, to hatch turtles and let them go. But like they say, uh, last summer I did just like two weeks of turtling, and I hadn't used my license in 20 years. There just isn't any market. And if you look at other animals, such as the sturgeon and the freshwater clams and stuff, there was big money involved in those things. And they needed protecting. And, and a lot of those things got wiped out to where they, well, the Russian sturgeon, you know, $5,000 a pound for caviar, things like that. That doesn't exist with turtles. And no commercial turtler is going to go anywhere to get the last couple hundred turtles. They, they only target the real large populations. And if you look at the year in and year out, since the 1920s, you look at the trends and how many have been produced, uh, it sounds like a renewable resource to me. And we're not hurting or impacting the population whatsoever. And if that turtle population was in, in trouble, just like in 2002, I would agree to, I would agree to stopping turtling. And, you know, I, the people that want to stop turtling and our goals are the same. Turtles are part of my heritage, too. I love turtles. I would not ever want to see those things in danger. But just to simply say, well, we can't use them anymore. We can't use them for food. We can't have them as pets. That's going to solve nothing. Let's take advantage. And uh, there's there's different compromises we could make. We could stock turtles. We could figure out how to do that. And, or simply let us sell our licenses. There's not very much money in this. and a lot of these people would gladly sell their license if somebody that's so worried that the turtles are going to go extinct, if, they, if a fair offer was made for their license, I'm sure they would gladly sell it, and then you wouldn't have to use it. License would be gone, but uh, at any rate, that's what I got to say, but the turtle population is not in jeopardy. Thank you, Mr. Riedemann. We appreciate your testimony today. Uh, next, we have Rex Campbell. Mm. Oh, Mr. Campbell, are you also on the phone? Um. <laughs> mm. Mr. Campbell? Uh. Well, it appears Mr. Campbell is having some technical difficulties, so maybe we'll we'll go on. Um, and uh, um, Senator Herr, would you like to uh, make a few comments, and then we'll have questions from members. Madam Chair, I, I really appreciate uh, the number of testify that came came on board, um, and. Uh, uh, talk to us perhaps later if Mr. Campbell can get on. I certainly want to hear uh, his point of view as well. Uh, and so I'll just stand by for a question right now and uh, also, you know, uh, see if the testifier could be also stand by for a question with me. Thank you. Um, and I, I do, have, I don't see any hands up right now, but I do have a question. So when we do commercial harvesting, what, what is the, um, 
what are we using the turtles for? Are they a food source? Are we using the shells? Or I rec I, I realize the recreational because I have Niswa in my district. And I remember in 2004 when we were going to outlaw all turtles and it was kind of a, it was a, it was pretty, pretty crazy because we have, you know, our, our tourism, uh, we have turtle races in every little town. So I'm glad to see that this bill has, has addressed that, but what, what really um, do we use um, turtle spark commercially? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I, uh, from my knowledge, it's mainly for, for food trade, you know, pets, uh, generally food and sometimes used for biological uh, supply for training. Um, and uh, some of this uh, harvesting has been sent overseas, mm -hmm. but I could certainly pass the DNR to give us a more uh, uh, documented uh, answer. Uh, Ms. Pierce, I see you clicked on. Would you uh, like to help with that? Yeah, I can. I can help with that. I think Senator Her had a, a lot of what it can be used for, and maybe Sean might have a little bit more background because he's dealing with the the licenses themselves. But um, other things that it can be used for is medis depending on the species of turtle, right? D um, food, uh, laboratory, educational uses, um, certainly pets, and sometimes um, medis medicinal uses also. And I think there are some uses sometimes for cosmetics. But I don't know if Sean wants, Sean Sisler would like to add anything to that. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, Madam Chair. This is uh, Sean Sisler. I'm with the Minnesota DNR. Welcome. <laughs> Um, Anne had a pretty good list, um, and it might we could probably also ask the commercial uh, turtlers what they sell uh, their turtles for as well. Uh, but that is my understanding that it's uh, food, uh, turtle races, and then biological supply are the are the main ones for Minnesota turtles, and then potentially medicinal, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I did have on the original list, I did have a Bill Bertle, but I guess he's not um, going to testify today. So with that, not seeing any other um, testimony or questions, Senator Herr, any um, closing comments before we um, lay this bill over? Uh, yes. Uh uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the concern of uh, turtle population and commercial harvesting moratorium has been talked about and put into place since the early uh, 2000, uh, which led to today's legislation, as uh, earlier present uh, presenter had mentioned. I ask that Senate File 1364, as amended, be passed from this committee for layover for possible inclusion. And so let's bring this legislation for turtle to the finish line to help ensure that they are around for the next generation. Thank you for your respectful attention. Thank you, Senator Herr. Uh, it's been really an interesting um, conversation. I, I think I learned a lot today, so thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, with that, Senate Bill 1394, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, thank you, members, for your attention today. And um, with that, no further business uh, before the committee, we are adjourned.